Hello everybody and welcome to the 10th episode of the Creative Insider. In this episode I have a chat with Federico Bianculo. Federico is a young Italian entrepreneur. He has a firm for architectural visualization called the Big Picture Visual and he has worked for many very important international architectural firms until he decided to go solo and ground his own company in Italy, in Bologna. He is also famous for the Ctrl Z blog, which is very popular among the Italian architectural students. So yeah, enjoy the talk and welcome to this new episode. Hello, everybody. Hello. Today I have on my podcast episode Federico Bianculo. Hi, Federico. Hi, Jordi. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, we have had some uh, technical issues, but finally we are recording. So hopefully this time everything will be fine. I hope uh, so. so. So, Federico, welcome. And I'm very happy to have you. I was telling you, I know you since a long time, but you don't know me that better uh, as I do. Um, so I know you from your blog, Control Z. Uh, that was a very cool, inspirational website for me when I was uh, starting in the, the field of architecture. So how did you come up with the idea of starting the, the blog? Well, you know, the idea of starting this, this blog, this website, it's, um, it happened in a particular time in my life. Um, I was in 2015. The blog is now five years old. And I was interning in, in Denmark at, uh, at an architectural office called Schmidt am Lessen. It's a, it's a pretty famous, famous one in, um, in Denmark and I think all over the world as well. Um, it was also the moment that I decided that I didn't want to design architecture anymore and do images, but that's maybe for later. Anyway, I was, I was reading a lot about, you know, open your own blog, maybe having a presence online, branding yourself even trying to monetize your ideas through a, through a blog. And I was really fascinated by this universe of communication, not just, not just of course, communication through, through blogging, but also communicating architecture through, through images, through, through diagrams. So there was kind of a natural association for me to, to build a blog based upon this, these ideas, you know. Um, there was something else as well on, on the blog, something that has really marked me and it reconnects very well with my with my education. Uh, for me, building my own portfolio was kind of a painful a painful experience because no one has ever told me how to build an architecture portfolio. So I basically didn't want people going through the same pain that I had, and that was the idea behind the blog. Not having people having a reference for for their projects, for their careers when they starting starting out in architecture. So that was the, the idea behind. And it was also heavily inspired by another popular uh, international website, which is Visualizing Architecture by Alex Ogrefe. It was a main source of inspiration for, for the blog. Yeah, probably you, you can see that. Uh, Alex Ogrefe, is a, as well as an architectural visualizer, is, a, is American, I think. Uh, I don't want to. Yeah, it's kind of, I think, a professor from what I know. But uh, I like the idea that you said about the blog, uh, like avoiding the pain uh, your your pain to other uh, to uh, to to other people. So because this is exactly why I've started this um, podcast uh, uh, to show first of all to create sort of um, clarity or guidance for the people who are starting some some sort of creative activity or uh, creative studies. So to tell the stories of the different creatives and to show how in the beginning everything it's so unclear, so uncertain, but you need to keep working, being consistent, and then there will be opportunities that you can that you can um, take uh, um, in the future, and then um, yeah, also to to share these different uh, point of views and avoid the pain of of this burden that you have in the uncertainty, and um, I think your your blog was. 
is still very very popular among the students because it's uh, it's a different kind of language. Usually in the Italian uh, universities, uh, everything is so theoretical and so um, yeah, it's so abstract. And then yeah, you go yeah. on your blog, and it's very very specific. You just find guidance for what you need. Yeah, it's basically the straight, straight to the point approach. Um, that, that's what I try to do with, with the tutorials, actually. It's specifically with the tutorials because I found there was a lack of tutorials. Nowadays, there's a, there's a lot of resources that you can, you can gather. Maybe not in Italian yet, but internationally, there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can find in, on YouTube as well. On, not really on blog, but rather on, on YouTube, I think. And that was the idea, just to have someone that could speak the language of the students as well. And not just giving them tutorials on how to perform certain tasks, such as you know, accomplish an image for their projects or a diagram or a or a, or a site plan, but also give them guidance on on career. You know, like I how can you say that it's more it's more like also lifestyle because you have also the all the beside articles about. Um, um, about uh, what, where to travel as an architect, what uh, gifts to present to to an architect. Uh, you have even, I remember, you have the article about uh, what laptop to choose or what uh, workstation and how did you build your own workstation. Yeah, and that was amazing because I I basically took the list of your parts. And I went to a computer shop and I said, I want this. How much it costs? And it was, <laughs> Does no. it work? Is it working? <laughs> Uh, well, when I showed the list, they were like, yeah, this can be combined in a better way and this can be changed. I can suggest you something else. But it, they were very impressed by, by my choice because okay. they, and I was very I was very surprised that uh, someone is sharing their knowledge because, you know, people are often afraid that if they share their knowledge, then the let's say the competition will get after them. So that that I, was um, also. I, I have a statement, I have a position about this because I like to share knowledge, but I also think that those people who seek out knowledge, they deserve success. So uh, if uh, if someone is receptive on on what I write and what I tell people, that maybe that person deserves to be educated, deserves to to have success in, in his path because it's, it's he's open, he's, he wants to learn. So the people that don't want to to get tutored, probably those people, they're not my target and I'm not interested in, in reaching those people, you know. So I'm not really afraid of competition because also because, you know, somehow what you give, you give, you get back eventually. Uh, exactly, exactly. And um, I think you're still very open because uh, um, I've reached out to you and you responded very positively, which I'm very happy of. And uh, when I told, uh, for example, because I have other friends of my, uh, my former university mates knows you too, because we were also all the users of your blog. And I said, ah, you know, next episode, the Federico Biancula is coming on the podcast. And they were like, oh, no, how cool. How did you manage? And then you're a very down to earth, uh, very down to earth person, which is very um, happy to hear and to see that you're open for dialogues and and um, sharing your stories. I also uh, so get very, get very emb embarrassed by... <laughs> That's a funny story. I get embarrassed by these you know, um, compliments and by, by people. I, I can tell you a story. I was, I was in Rotterdam because I also work in Rotterdam. I was at, at, uh, at the dinner table with friends and I was like, oh, what do you do for a living? I was like, oh, you know, I just do images and I have, my, I have a blog, a website about architecture. And then I was like, uh, oh, but what's your surname? Yeah, my surname is Bianculo. And the guy next to me was like, oh, you're Federico Bianculo. Oh, my God. I was I was so shocked by this reaction because the guy actually is my tutorials to, to do his own graduation thesis. And I was like, okay, that's shockingly, that, that shock, that's shocking to me. I mean, it's a, it's a shocking situation. Never got into, into something like this. So I was kind of, you know, you start realizing that you, you did something that has, has had an impact to, to certain people on certain people on, on lives on, on career right? yeah that's the, that's the effect you get by um, by having this uh, digital presence you were talking in the beginning you know like you create uh, this uh, consistent uh, content which is uh, quality content for the people because when they use it they get the results and they're happy 
and so you create your your brand. So if you ask me, um, who do you know in the visualization field? I you are among the people I think in the first moment when somebody asked me about visualization because uh, not only I've seen your work and it's a good work, but I know that you share this uh, knowledge and that's like a proof of your of your experience. So I think that this blog for you has been sort of a um, boost for your no, no, to to get you to be notorious, let's say. Um, but let's go one step. Yeah, back. Yeah, so yeah. in the beginning, how? Mm, because for example, I I decided I'm gonna work toward the field of architecture when I was very young after the middle school in Italy, because. Um, my mother, she worked in, in some uh, governmental org- organizations in, uh, in Bulgaria, where I was born. And um, w- she realized that to, in these um, other fields where there is not such a clear uh, outcome of your work, you need also a lot of relationships to, to come forward to, to be successful. And I've had this talent into drawing and uh, have this... Uh, very developed imagination so she said why don't you go to study in a high school of art and then you can become an architect by drawing uh, buildings and buildings are the same all over the world so you can also be have an international career which i actually happen to do because now i'm in germany and how did you decide uh, you wanted to to have to do something with architecture and buildings it was kind of a Mm, umbrella choice. Let me explain. Because I was not set into architecture since the since the outset, since uh, since I finished high school. Uh, I was more like into advertisement. That was that was my idea of having you know of, of my work life in the future. Because I had this English teacher that had a daughter in advertisement that, that also devised a famous Italian TV TV commercial for uh, for the fish sticks. So she she was really proud of her her daughter devising this commercial for the fish sticks. And I was fascinated by the story. And I was like, okay, that maybe that's something that I want to do. I want to to work in communication and advertisement. And I knew as a fact that this this girl had um, had studies into economics. So that's what I took at the, uh, at the beginning. I took economics. I took six months uh, of economic study before just realizing that 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 was not really what I wanted that was not really <laughs> what I what I was what I was thinking of signing up for then I just you know I just quit after six months I, I quit university and that was a uh, at a turning point I didn't know what to do so my parents told me that probably something good for me would be architecture because it would would have helped have helped me in the future having more possibilities, more more chances of doing what I wanted, like discover, of discovering out what I wanted to do in the future. So so I just took architecture because it was a, you know, um, a very multidisciplinar, I don't know if that's, that's an English word, but there's a lot of disciplines in architecture if you think about it. That's, that's not just... That's not just yeah. Know. There is everything. Yeah, there is a little bit everything. of everything. Exactly. That's you need to know how to draw, how to design. You need to know how to lay out a little typography to pick up your phone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you're doing a blog, you need to do uh, also websites, blogging, uh, videos. If you do tutorials, videos for presenting your projects. Yeah. So you that was my idea. Photography, everything. That was my idea, you know, because yeah, maybe architecture can give me a a wide set of skills that I can just use anywhere, anywhere I wish to in the future. So, you know, let's just, let's just keep going on this road and let's see what happens. That was my, <laughs> that was my, I, my. And uh, where did you study in, in which part of Italy, which university? I studied, I studied in a, in a small university in, in the South of Italy, uh, in, um, in University of Campania at the time was Seconda Università di Studi di Napoli. The, the university was located in uh, in Aversa, which is a, a small city in um, in the north part of Campania. And I I kind of you know regret maybe it's not the right word, but I wish I knew better at the time because I suffered a bit from that university being a really really small town university. I could just feel it. Also, people were just from the from the surroundings. It's not like you know Milan or Venice that you get people from from all over Italy, for example. So 
It was a very small minded. Yeah, it was it was working well. It was not a bad university, but it was really small minded, not so international. Uh, there was not not yet probably more. now. There's there's a few things extra right now, but there were not so many you know choices to internationalize your your studies, and you know that's something that I that I try to address later on in my in my career. So, that- but um, I can tell you from my personal experience. For example, I studied in Rome at the University La Sapienza, which is uh, the biggest university in Europe, and uh, it was a huge faculty with a lot of people and uh, also a lot of people from uh, all around Italy. And there were a lot of Erasmus people because, of course, uh, Rome for Erasmus it's very, very you know interesting popular, destination. And uh, but. The, the amount of people is that big that the professors and the teachers does just don't have that time to dedicate to you or as a student or to the students in general. Mm-hmm. So you need to figure out a lot by, you, by yourself. Yeah. And then I came to be an Erasmus in Frankfurt in Germany. I met people from other Italian university, for example, um, I don't remember which university it was, I think from the University of Aquila. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, and they were they were used to this uh, different um, approach of the professors because they were not so many people in their university and they could learn just better. So maybe this was an advantage to you if if you didn't even know it, like that you were in a yeah, small yeah, university yeah. and maybe no, that, that's something I know for sure. This was one one of the upsides of my choice because the university was small. Maybe the first two years where uh, we had bigger classes, but then from the third year on we had really small workshops. So I could just meet great professors, great uh, get great great teachings, you know, and there was also activities uh, in there. It was not like something really <laughs> really bottomless or uh, something really really lost in, in the middle of Campania. There was some actual possibilities and I tried to to exploit those possibilities as, as much as I could, you know. Uh, but for, for readers for readers as me of your blog, uh, we know that uh, then your your career and your life turned to be very international. So when when happened this switch from this small university to to moving uh, abroad? How did it happen? Why did you move first abroad? Well, one thing that I wanted to, uh, well, not that I wanted, but I knew for sure about my career is that I didn't want to stay just in Italy, that I wanted to travel. So I was already convinced to, to just go abroad. And then I just asked my my thesis tutor that he was really well connected and uh, had an international, you know, had international acquaintances, he's a famous architecture critic in Italy, if he could just recommend me to for an internship somewhere. So he recommended me to a few places, and I actually started in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, I was interning for six months at Saarbrücken. Probably you know the you know them since you're... Uh, yeah, I know them. They have a very, very interesting building. I live 10 minutes away from one of their buildings. Exactly. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, they have these very funny buildings, which are um, modular and have one side which is colorful and the other side, which is mainly glass. So when you see the building from one side, it looks like this very colorful shape. And on the other side, it looks like a lot of buildings that you see around that are just glass buildings. So they are very famous uh, architecture studio there. I think they they work for um, OMA in Rotterdam and then they become also partners. Yeah, But what what year you moved to Germany? What year? Uh, 2013. And it, that was the the end of your university studies, or was? No, no. My uh, I I finished university in, at the end in December 2012. So it took me six months to get my my first internship. But more than architecture, it's more. It was more of a personal thing because I was I, I was in love with the idea of me traveling, of me working abroad. So that's a tricky one because maybe it's not the right way to approach things because if you fall in love with the, with an idea rather than on the process or uh, the you learning stuff from from internships it's not gonna go it's not gonna go well i mean that's something that i discovered later on with with a lot of pain as well so what what so you had this uh, certain expectations and yeah. when you moved abroad uh, what was different from what you imagined no, I didn't have really expectations on on living and working abroad. I had expectations on myself. 
actually. I had expectations of me working in a big office abroad or having international acquaintances, uh, living in a big capital, in a big city in, uh, somewhere in Northern Europe. So I had all this set of expectations that I put on myself. As for expectations of working abroad, I, I came with an open mind to that. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. So I was really, you know, yeah, very open. Because when I started in Germany, I, was, I worked for five months on, on detailed sheets of a, of a building in Luxembourg. And that's not what, I, <laughs> not what I expected. Yeah, probably maybe I expected something. Maybe I expected to work in competitions, you know, or in these fast-paced creative projects, you know, uh, flash images, hectic uh, timelines. Uh, that's not something that I got until like the very last end of my internship in, in Germany. And okay. was, you know, kind of you know, uh, I was like, yeah, that's not what I expected. Doing five detail sheets for five months, but I guess it's also part of the part of the job. So that's what kind of my expectations about working into a big architecture office. So you can say, but I'm more interested about the expectations that I put on myself here because that's something that has influenced me a lot later on. So and and say. after that first internship, okay, so you so you've worked most of your internship in the executive phase, let's say, yeah. uh, which is about making these drawings for the construction place. Uh, but and then what was your next move? Did, so you had this six months internship, or how long is it? And then what happened? Yeah, uh, I had this six months internship, and uh, then I moved on. Uh, I moved on. I moved to, a, to another office because I just wanted to move to another place. I had this, you know, wonder Wanderlust in German. You call it like that. Uh, yeah. I wanted to to visit places. I wanted to travel to see different different offices and understand what was good for me because you know even that time that i was doing architecture then i was starting to realize that something was not quite right uh, something was off uh, that, that I, that's not what i probably wanted to do i was really attracted by the images of by communicating architecture through images and that's something that i realized later on in my life not uh, not in germany for sure i started to realize this uh, when I when I worked in the in the Netherlands for Meccano as an intern in two thousand from two thousand thirteen to two thousand fourteen, yeah, yeah, that was the time. So, but did you did you move right after Sour Broken Hutton to Meccano? Yes, it was March two thousand fourteen. Yeah. I got okay. Two thousand fourteen. No. And I want to ask you another side question because um, as your as your blog, this show is also. Uh, straight to the point to explain, for example, to the listeners if they're um, wanting to follow your path in some way. Um, for example, when you moved to do this internship, uh, were you uh, paid enough to, to support yourself or did you get support from, from maybe your family? How, how did you manage to, to hopper through, through the cities? I had a bit of support from my family, but the pay was was quite enough for an intern. I think uh, I think if you could you could just try to squeeze in, you know, enough to to make yourself a, to earn yourself a living, especially in Berlin, because Berlin was was quite cheap at the time. Well, for for sure now it's a bit more expensive, but it's not not for sure for sure not one of the most expensive cities in in Europe. Uh, so, no, yeah. not even in Germany. Um, I I live in in Frankfurt. Frankfurt is second more, more most expensive, and I think Munich is the most expensive in oh, Germany. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. And and then you move to Rotterdam, you say in Meccano. Yes, Meccano is in Delft, which is a small historical city in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah. And I lived I lived really close to Rotterdam. Yes, when I, when I was there, so it was. But yeah, but another another thing is that in Delft they have this uh, university, right, the, of uh, about yeah, yeah. architecture. Yeah, yeah. So they have this sort of uh, hive where they generate a lot of uh, great architects. Yeah, yeah the great concentrations of, of great great minds in uh, in Rotterdam and Delft. Yeah, so it was a um, it was a really inspiring place, and I, I still think that Mecham is a really inspiring place to to work at. Um, and there, that's that's when I basically started doing, you know, production, image production, diagram production for, for architecture. So I was, I was really pumped. <laughs> I was really did happy. You, did, you, did they have uh, their own uh, internal, I don't know, visualizing uh, team or...? 
how it worked. They didn't, no, they didn't have a team. They had a person that was uh, was doing renders, but nothing more than that. So, by the way, I want to I want to tell the people fourteen. So it was um, it was a bit behind in time, and it was not a really organizing. It was just a person that was quite good with with renders and was just doing the job for them. So it was not not there was not even a preparation on that. It was not a formation scheme for that. I want to just tell the people that don't don't know those offices. Like, uh, yeah, I, I like the, how you talk about it because you're talking uh, very very easy about it, but. Uh, this is like if we can compare it. You work for uh, George Armani, and then you work for Dolce Gabbana, and you just talk about it like <laughs> it's nothing special. <laughs> but that's for a, sure, that, that's an interesting story about that. Maybe I can, we can touch on it later because it goes on. Um, on that, that's that's again the topic of expectations. That's a, that's another interesting story for for that about big names in architecture. Uh, yeah, but let's go step by step because that's interesting to to do everything. Yes. Yes, and then you started the, this uh, to work more into the competitions field and uh, more in design, and then not creating. Yet. Not, not, yet, not yet, because even at McKenna, was just working on one to one team on a um, on a project for six months, and it was this hospital, this hospital, uh, this big hospital. I remember, I remember the place well, it's, uh, close to Amsterdam, but I was really happy to to work with that team because it was a. Uh, it was a great team. It was a, a great task as well because I was in charge of uh, delivering images for the client. So I was the one preparing the images for for the communication, for the presentations to the to the end client. And I was happy, you know, I was happy of doing that. I was going back home really, really satisfied about my job. I was happy with my girlfriend. I was saying, yeah, you know, today I, I did this presentation. I, I made these images. What do you think about it? So that's when I... I started realizing that uh, design probably was something that I was happy to, to leave behind. But it's not easy to, to realize that because at the time I didn't even know, I didn't knew that um, art viz was a profession. It was a thing, you know. Didn't didn't really know about firms. No, actually in Germany I worked in a small competition and that's when I started discovering about art viz offices. Uh, so I was Starting to get acquainted with the idea, but I was—I didn't—I didn't know a lot. Of th- I didn't know a, a lot, a lot of things. So it was a really slow process to understand that this could have been a career, this could have been a thing for my life. So it takes time. And uh, and from there, then um, you 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 develop this passion and. Uh, did you after after you realized this you you kept moving to follow your uh, vandal vandalus so to say like you moved then from Meccano to another city again on how how you moved after that how did you develop your career further on yeah i was after Meccano, i was you know I, a bit lost so you can say i was not really sure that i really wanted to keep just designing you know, so I was not really convinced whether I should just have go have been going for a junior position in some offices in the Netherlands or just visit another place before going to towards a junior position because I was really looking at my career and my experience and I was like, okay, six months plus six months, maybe that's not enough. It's not enough to get a junior position. So maybe I should just get another another internship. And this time took me took me a while to to get an internship somewhere else. It took me something like Four months because there was also uh, there was also moving involved. My my parents were moving out of their places, so there was this this event involved, and it took me quite a long time this time to get back into the into into my my career again into the to work. Uh, but that's when I got another internship in Denmark because I uh, that's what I, another place that I wanted to to end up at, but. Before that, and th- there was something else happening in in my life uh, after Meccano. You know, I was already planning to go another internship, and I just started writing everywhere, like the biggest names that you can think about, could think about. I just was writing to them, expecting answers, uh, expecting a response from them. And one day, I was in the Netherlands. I was just towards the end of my internship at Meccano, and I just got an email from from New York, from New York, from an office called BRK Angels Group. And they just wanted me for for an internship over there in in New York for okay. nine months. 
So you can imagine now how shocked was I to, to receive such an email in my inbox. I was like, wow, what's going to happen? Is this real? So going back to the to the to the comparison, BRK Ingus Group is probably one of the most significant and relevant architects of, of our time. I can just as big as them, because the, their acronym is big, probably there's a, just, just a few others for probably three or four other offices as big as them. But it was in New York, you know, so that was an, another turning point because I was really expecting for myself to push to push myself to sacrifice all I could to just go there, stay in New York for nine months, far from, from everybody, far, probably far from my girlfriend as well, far from my family, to follow, to change my career. But for what? Then I started to think about it. And that was not for me. That's what, that's what I realized because it took me a lot, a lot of time, probably years to realize that I wanted to stay close somehow to my to my roots. I wanted to stay to stay close to to my my beloved ones, and I, I kept chasing that internship, but I was not so, not so convinced about that because I had this feeling. It was not so clear yet. It, it became clear a few years after that event, but you know that that's when I started realizing that probably working for big names, working for uh, for the big players, it's not such a great thing after all. And it's something that came up very late in my in my career. So you can say I, I can say I, I don't I haven't I haven't worked for such a big uh names as you did, uh because um I I was more practical in a sense that I wanted to 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 get to go independent as soon as possible. I didn't want to depend on my family, so I I followed rather uh, positions where, of course, I had fun working at, but also that I was getting uh, paid uh, well enough to to be totally independent. But um, currently, I'm I'm working in a big international company, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a lot of pressure too. What people do, like it sounds so fascinating to say, okay, I'm working at Meccano, I'm working. Uh, at uh, Sauerbrook and Hatten, but in those company, those are the, the 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 best players in in the league. So you need to perform also a lot, and they have o- always very strict deadlines, a lot of work, a lot of late hours. And as you said, then you need to decide what is more important for you: your personal life and the things that you love beside architecture, or you dedicate basically most of the time of your life into into this activity oh, yeah. and that's another kind of words because my idea at the time was the expect again the, the topic of expectation that was putting on myself that i the image i had of myself that of me working with those big players but then on i realized that maybe yeah exactly it's not it's not it's not that a big deal that a big deal because there you have to sacrifice a lot of things in order to to get in there um and there's another, something that is deeply wrong in architecture because the higher you go, the, the more crazy it gets, probably. So there's another thing that I was trying to advocate through the, through the pages of my, of the Control Z blog about late, night in archite- late nights in architecture or over, over time in architecture, that it's something that I'm, I'm really against. I got caught up as well through my profession, through doing images, but it's something that I'm really against because... It arms a lot, not just yourself, but also the the whole industry, because you you're expected in architecture to to work eight hours, uh, to give yourself completely to competitions to design. Even though if you even though you have a you know interests interests outside architecture, you have a family, maybe you have friends, and you start sacrificing stuff. And it's kind of sad that you see architects hanging out only with architects. You know, it's something that. Certain, yeah, that's true. Yeah. that's true. Especially in Rome, and, yeah. I had this circle. Of, yeah, most of them are still I still in touch with them. They're friends, but most of my acquaintances they were architects, and that kind of you know made me think about what kind of life we're we're living in this industry and if it's right. Because if you think about other industries like uh, legal or banking, these people they they still do they still perform a really important service but they don't work as much as we do in terms of hours so yeah but i always say that because uh, some people then don't understand it but um the 
every field of creativity has this very um, uncertain result because it's not like reading a book or it's not like making calculations or it's not like you have this idea in your mind and you need to um, make it uh, physical, make it uh, work and you need to combine your idea, the design with a lot of other aspects uh, like uh, statics, like the different uh, rules you have in the different countries and it's this takes a lot of time and and sometimes um you get caught up in these very close deadlines where there are also a lot of money on the line and you need it's 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 the industry as you said it's uh it's how it works yeah but when you when when you get in this moment where you, where you, where you get this email from from basically what could be considered the dream of every very passionate person person of um in the architectural field and you r- realize that um that it's not for you was that a very disruptive moment where you needed to sort of reassess what what you're going to do yeah because then like like you said you rightly said maybe i was not such a passionate person about that and it's kind of hard to come to this realization it comes later to you uh that's something that I was also seeing in, in university. I was not the type, kind of guy uh, devouring newspapers, uh, not newspapers, uh, magazines, architecture magazines. There, I was not that kind of guy that was just staying, uh, browsing uh, Art Daily and Archetizer and the zine. Uh, <laughs> most of, you know, of the time he, he was browsing the internet. I was not that kind of guy. Uh, that made, made me think as well that probably I was not a designer after all. Uh, something that not was not my passion, so I was left wondering. Then, what's my passion? And then the the, the answer dawned to me later on when I when I when I terminated because I terminated my internship in Denmark after a few months because I was not happy designing. I was happy doing images, and that's coincidentally 2015 when I started the blog. So that's when I when I also accepted that I didn't want to design, that it didn't really matter to to go to the stars, but I, I wanted to do images, nice images. I wanted to communicate architecture. That's that, that was my you know my dimension somehow. And, and how did you keep working towards? Uh, so the next career step was looking for a uh, a chance to go to develop in that direction or how did you move further on? Yeah. Uh, I will say that about this, I'm not an example to follow because if I just, if I, of course, everybody says that, but if I could just go back in time, probably I would do the same very steps because I was convinced that I could just do it somehow on my own, but not really because I, I didn't have a network developed. So initially, I was set on the idea of doing renders for for students, but I never I never got actually to that point because I saw an opportunity popping out at, at McCann again. Uh, they were open for looking for someone doing images for them, a render artist, and then I just contacted my old team leaders and asking them if there, there was a space for me on that. Uh, in that area and eventually I got the job and I have to say I was not really prepared I was really you know I was going there blindly didn't really know yet the craft I I, I don't think I I know it yet as well (laughs) I think I still have a lot to learn but that time I was really clueless I mean there's a software we use in the industry it's 3D 3D Studio Max is one of the most widespread widespread, uh, pieces of software used in the industry to do images and all I knew about that software was just the basic commands when I started my position as a 3D artist at, at McCann. So it was kind of, okay, now I have to start working my, my way up, up, up and up. But uh, I know for sure that, um, of course, it was a brave decision and a lot of the the um, architectural visualizers are um, architects which had your same same. Uh, feeling that they were draw, driven from something different, which is this uh, passion for representing the design. And um, if you have a deep passion about something, 
uh, no matter how clueless are in the beginning, you're going to figure it out very quickly because you love it. And when you love something, I think you just dive in into it and you look yeah. for... Um, There's also sort of, you know, um, uh, being being reckless about this. Probably you, you know about the Dunning-Kruger curve, you know. So when you start doing something, you think, ah, maybe uh, I'm pretty good at this. Then the curve starts dropping drastically and then you start thinking i don't know anything about this that's that's exactly what what happened to me because at the beginning i was convinced that i could do this job very well for them and then i kept realizing that probably i still had a lot to learn about this craft but all in all i'm really happy about working there uh, i got to work on a few interesting projects it was a quiet time i have to say at the office at that in that moment not so many competitions going on a lot of projects, a lot of um, commissions from clients, a lot of projects uh, going on and well-developed. So it was not so hectic. I know as a fact that now it's very hectic hectic over there. But I was happy because I was mostly working on press release. So I was doing images for press releases of their projects and also a few competitions. But probably working there was what shaped me the most as a, as a professional working in the, in the industry of architectural visualization. So I'm really glad I, I got the chance to, to work there. Even though if I just could go back, probably I would stay even more time there. Uh, I would just spend more time instead of rushing things because I I always had this urge to to start my own thing, to start my my own brand in the in the field. Probably you know waiting a bit more a bit more time would have would have been so bad for me. Would have been really beneficial. But did you have some some sort sort of guidance at that office, or you were uh, basically a standalone 3D artist that was working on his own, or you had some other colleagues which were also doing the same things and were more experienced who were guiding you through the process? How how a, did it work? There was another colleague, yeah, there was another colleague, but I was basically on my own because we didn't we didn't team up on, on images. Uh, so yeah, I was basically on on my own. So I had to learn the craft from, from scratch. I, I know as a fact that other offices have teams. So probably when you get into this team, you get educated, you get, uh, you learn quick, you learn very quickly what you have to do. Um, the trade, the tricks of the trade, the tools of the trade, tricks of the trade as well. I didn't have all this process. So it was really, you know, slow, a slow grind for me to, to learn all, all this stuff. Um, so that's one of the things that I missed in my background. So working for a team, uh, being educated as an architectural visualization artist by someone else that was doing that for for more than me. So basically you you say you yourself taught at that time how to make a a good image uh, by using the software, doing the lighting, um, and every and how how long did you did you do this job? But basically I think two years. I was there for, for two years. So that's when I decided that I wanted to another wanted to move on again. And I wanted to to know what is it like to work for for someone that, that does this for as a as a living, you know. Uh so I just went on and tried to work for a for a for a visualization company based in uh, based in Rotterdam to see to see what was going on. And probably there I had some you know, expectations again. The expectations that I have, they come later when I when I finish the experience and then I realize what, what should have been different from that experience. So I just moved on again after two years at Meccano. I moved on to this company and as a senior three D visualization artist. Uh, it was an interesting experience for sure. It made me understand uh, a few things about how to do certain things and how not to do other things, what you need to be successful in that field. Um, so yeah, even if it was another short experience for for reasons, <laughs> uh, it was really interesting because I also got to got to keep really tight relation relationship with my colleagues over there, and that's something of one of the best things that I I got from from that that experience. Yeah, uh, but then I I realized yeah. very early in that time that. Being a creative, uh, you cannot just go blindly. You cannot just go 
full creative. You also have to get, you have, you need a good grip on on a lot of different stuff on you know your timeline, your budget, your your network. So that's something that yeah, it's a, it's a very complicated yeah. uh, set of uh, set of skills and set of abilities you need to have. And that's also something very hard because, as you said, in in the industry you work a lot of hours and then you get drained to 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 the point where you don't care that much about uh, planning your your relationship, your network, and yeah. that can be a little frustrating for someone that wants to build also this. Yeah, set. sometimes you just get you know you just get in the mindset of we just have to get this done. Uh, we have to do as much as possible for clients. We have to do as much as possible, uh, take as many, as many requests as possible. But you have to really plan carefully what you're what you're gonna do with with your brand, uh, because it's not just about producing images anymore. Well, it's, it has never been about producing images, just producing images. There's a, there's a lot of things at play, and I wish that I I could just have more more insight on these topics when I when I spent my time in this, this visualization office in Rotterdam because I was producing images but I didn't have much insight on these processes of, of client communication. Basically no one told me how to properly communicate with a client, how to to make you know quotes for rendering. So that's something else that I, I really had to to improvise and come up with my for myself. Of course. Basically. Yeah, it's something that uh, you need to discover from the beginning, and then yeah. you go to somewhere, someone that has already done it, so you can s- steal that process by by just working there. A, li- a little uh, bit, inspired, get a bit inspired rather than stealing. Even though I didn't, it's I, positive I, stealing. I mean, yeah, yeah of yeah. course. I had the hint that there was this thing, there was these things in the field, but I didn't have you know the grasp on it. I I just had this feeling that. There was something else, but I didn't have someone on my side tell me tell me how to you know communicate with a client, how to to improve myself in communication. Everything was really frenetical, was really hectic. Everything was really rushed somehow. Uh, something some sometimes very dysfunctional as well. Most of the time, I have to say, it was dysfunctional. Uh, it was not it's not an easy place to work at, but it's uh, it paid off eventually. It paid off so still happy about about that and uh then that was basically the end of your time in in rotterdam then you yeah. moved on yeah i moved on um you, you I moved have... on to denmark then what, what no, came no, there i just took the choice to to move back to italy because it was it was 2017 at the time after the two year two year two years at uh, in rotterdam i thought that maybe you know in the expat life uh, was not really what I wanted. Uh, it was already for four years that I was moving back and forth, so it was time for me to move to move on to a different stage of my life and try to do something something on my own. Even though today sometimes I still think it's a was a bit of a rush decision, but you know the expat life it's uh, it's what it is. I, I I was thirty. I was thirty at the time, so I was like okay. I, I'm 30. Probably the expat life is not what I what I want for my future. I want to be a bit more stable, and I'm not I'm not seeing myself living in the Netherlands. I don't I don't see my my life going on here in this country. So I just moved back to Italy, and for me, starting my own thing was kind of you know uh, not an obligated choice, but something that was really I really pushed myself. Uh, to do, even though probably it was always a matter of expectations, a matter of uh, seeing yourself as having your own office, uh, working for uh, for beautiful projects. So that's something that something completely different from what I did uh, from the, from what I did until that moment, you know. And when when you moved to Italy, back to Italy, which city, which city did you move? Did you move go back to to your hometown, or where did you go? <laughs> I didn't want to stay in my hometown. I wanted a, a place that was, you know, not so not so big, not so hectic as Milan, uh, but still a big city, a city that I could just, you know, was a good spot for traveling to just, you know, visit clients or just travel internationally for leisure. So the the choice fell on Bologna. 
because Bologna is a really cozy town in the, in the north part of Italy. Uh, it has a really, you know, nice way of living. You really feel it's a, it's a cozy place to, to live. And it also it is also very well connected to my hometown and to internationally as well with the rest of Europe and the world. So it was kind of, you know, a strategic decision about the, the choice of Bologna. There was a strategic element. Uh, but I'm curious to ask you something that's um, because we've talked so far about the, develop, the development of through your studies and then your career. Uh, but um, as as we were also saying that you are as a creative, you are not only a creative, but you, but you're a person. So beside your uh, life, uh, work life, which is also mainly your passion. Uh, how was the life abroad um, for you personally? Um, for example, in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, the the culture I think it's very different than from Italy. How was it for you personally? Did you have a culture shock? Did you have something that for you was uh, interesting? Something for you that was weird, or something that you learned from that countries uh, and somebody something that you brought to that countries with your culture is that something that's remarkable for me for that experience yeah it was something remarkable not not from germany not from the netherlands actually i was uh, i really you know got to fit into the into the netherlands somehow the fir- for the first six months um i had a huge culture shock from denmark uh, uh, in, w- in which way well, not so not so nice way because I I quickly realized that Danish people are really a tight group, so it's re- was really difficult to fit in for me. Also because I stayed really really short for a really short time, so maybe I'm not the right person to say so. But I had the impression that it was a really tight group and expats, especially in Oros, because Oros is um is still a small city. It was not Copenhagen. Copenhagen is way more international than Oros. So I had this feeling of being a really close community. Uh, it was not really, not well accepting of foreigners, but I, I, won't, I wouldn't say that they were not accepting or welcoming. There was a bit, you know, they kept their own distances. So that's something that I, I felt at a, uh, on an emotional level. And that's something mm. that put me off that country somehow. Which is beautiful, by the way. I mean, I, I love Copenhagen. I love strolling around Oros, and but you know, there's something that put me off about that. Uh, yeah, because for example, for example, for me was uh, there were many, many uh, things that were uh, I needed to learn with time by living in Germany. But for example, what I something I've noticed that um, why German people are. Um, are the 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 the, perce- the way they are perceived abroad is because I think that German people are extremely honest mm-hmm. and direct. So <laughs> they they tell you sometimes things that they really think, but they don't do it by meaning bad. They just yeah. want to be honest with you, and then it sounds like, uh, for example, in Italy, we always uh, people are very uh, warm and they very um, yeah connecting to each other. And they never say no. And here in Germany, they're like, if you ask them to do something that they don't want to do really or they're not interested, they will tell you, yeah, yeah thank you, but no, I, I'm not interested. And it sounds, it sounded so rude to me in the beginning. Uh-huh. And then I realized, no, but it's actually kind of interesting because in Italy, whenever, whatever you say to your friends, they'll be like, yeah, we're going to do it. And then maybe you won't do it, but they just say it because it's nice to say in here. And this is something, for example, that I realized here in Germany by living now almost uh, five years that but uh, people that are... appreciate about this about these countries because the Netherlands is the same Nether- ne- ne- uh, Danish not Danish uh, Dutch people are famous for their their honesty probably even more than the, than the Germans so I, it, this is something that I really appreciate of them because then I, I just I, I could know that if I got a you know positive comment that was sincere so I yeah, have, yeah. You know, since I'm, uh, I'm I'm a bit insecure on certain things uh, I knew as a fact then then when a Dutch person or a German person complimented me on something that was heartfelt that was sincere that I, had, that I did a good job so that's something that I appreciate of that appreciated of that culture and um, I, I want to to give you props here to another point because uh, you had the courage to 
to to drop uh, your job in in uh, the Netherlands and go back to Italy and uh, start start something on your own in in your in your home country where where it's not so easy to start something on your own and a lot of people are afraid but i think that it's uh, so cool that you you gather this whole uh, collection of knowledge from 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 all over the the from all over europe in countries with such a different uh, background and then you went back to bologna and then it's there where the big picture started yeah that's when that's when i started with the big picture, yes. And so, so the big picture for the people who doesn't know, it's not just a way of saying the big picture. It's uh, the name of your company, right? Yeah, it's the name of my of my brand. For a long time, I was just being myself behind the behind this brand. Now, there's a person that helps me regularly on projects, and we I'm trying to develop a, a network of of freelancers because you know Italy is nice and whole. It's nice to live here. It's but it's difficult to to scale up a, a business, especially in this field in Italy. Especially if you work with Italian clients. Now I work with Italian clients as well, but what they do is mostly abroad. So it's not that's not really the case. It's it gets easier when you're Italian and, and you work for foreign companies or companies that work abroad. I have to say. But how? Um, so you you grounded this company. So basically, um, it's uh, what what did you need to? Did you start working from from home when you started? Uh, because basically, what you need for doing visualization is a good workstation. Yeah. And your softwares, and and then you need a space where to, to sit well, and work on. That's what I'm still doing. I mean, I started working from home, from my office, home office, because I have a, a room that is a is my own office, so I have my setup, and I still do it. This year was the year that I had to move, so I, that, that was planned to move into an office on a, on a co-working or doing something like this in Bologna, probably. This has not happened for obvious reasons for COVID nineteen, of course. So I'm I'm still here and probably working this time from home, kind of helped me to to be prepared uh, for this challenge that came. So I'm I'm already set up for for working from home. Uh, all the big projects that we did, they were all did remotely uh, with my with my collaborators from home. So we're already you know, set up for, for this kind of future, if this kind of future is going to happen. So, and and what kind, um, I'm just out of curiosity, so to that we give an idea to, to the listeners of what it takes. For, so you worked, uh, you said four years or five years abroad? Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. And then did you save something and then with what... Uh, you can tell me roughly what kind of investment you needed to do to, to set up your firm. Well, kind of money investment, of course, you need uh, to plan to plan ahead. Of course, you need a good workstation. Probably you start need considering, but like, we can get very technical here because then you have choices about uh, whether to build a render farm in house or having remote. You know, going with a remote farm. Of course, there's hardware, the workstation, as I was saying. There's licenses, the cost of licenses. So, uh, startup capital was 10, 10k, something like that. If you want to, go. yeah, because also you have to plan that maybe there will be a little, I don't know, uh, in the beginning, or you had already, uh, yeah, that, that's sort of portfolio of clients already, or we can, or you were ready also to, to, we can to go over and over the place with this topic because, of course, when you start on your own, you cannot just rely on uh, on capital uh, of your studio, but you just also need a you know a buffer for yourself because when you go freelancing or you open your own company, you're just not guaranteed to get clients from the outset, so you have to, to put aside some money to to prepare for. For months, months without work, uh, I had the I had the fortune of working with clients since the since the beginning, since day zero basically of my of my endeavor. So that was kind of you know lucky as well. Um, kind of building a network in the Netherlands before I left. Uh, even though I think that could have been better, I could have built much more a wider a much wider network if I stayed more. But yeah, that's very, that's something very important that people have to realize about opening their own company is that two things, actually. One, you cannot just go straight thinking that work is going to, to rain on you and then you have to, to get a buffer for yourself to live on your own. 
and you have to spend time on building your relationship. That's the two main things because, and you have to plan time to do that because clients are not going to reach, reach out to you, especially if you're starting out. I still have, you know, I, in, right now I'm in this situation because uh, the COVID-19 has changed some things for me. I, I started to work less with certain clients. I'm starting uh, to work more and to, to get more towards another type of client. So, Right now, I'm starting to do active, you know, uh, client acquisition. That's something that I, I never really had to need to do so far because work was was coming anyway. So you have to plan about this, and that's something that I didn't really do because I didn't feel the need to. But if you want to build an office, if you want to build a company, you also have to plan these acquisition activities. You have to plan research and development activities. You have to plan days that you in which you plan your finances and you. Just do communication, so it's not just about production of images, but it's uh, there's a lot of things. There's also social media as well, which is another 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 whole story, another another thing that takes a lot a lot time a lot of time. That's something that I realized lately that I was you know trying to do my own social media and I, I couldn't do it anymore because it was too too tiresome. It took me too much time. So <laughs> you also have to yeah, but. You- you kind of have the blog, which is sort of your um, manifesto, if you want to yeah, say. I it sort of. Well, that's the thing. It's uh, it's an Italian, you know. That's that's the kind. There's a that's this gap because the blog is is in Italian, and my my customers are meant to be international. So there's uh, this this kind of gap that is not going to be filled very easily. And the blog, due to the to my to me trying to to tend to my office, the blog went dormant for a couple of years. Probably you noticed that. But luckily, I found a really great guy, Luca, that's now helping me with the articles and with the reorganizing the, the blog. And we started all over again. So we started publishing new articles, new topics, and probably this is going, this is going to, to increase in the, the next few months with, with more plans also to, to bring it as a side activity, set a side hustle, probably. I, I was thinking when when because for example you had this uh, this platform your blog where you announced uh, that the big picture is set up and I was uh, when I when I when I read that news I was excited because um, I, I went to the um, to the website I often I often go to to website like yours to to get inspiration for for my own projects and for the projects I work on. And um, I, I was thinking maybe maybe the big picture will in, englobe the the control Z block and that there will be this um, side of the, the the website that will be your professional one, and then the big the the, the control Z block will be integrated sort of like okay, this is when we do it for for you, and this is how you can learn from us. Um, but it stayed. It it got some rebranding recently. I noticed that that you refreshed um, the whole branding of the blog. Yeah, it was and, not so um, easy. Probably it was one year ago already. But yeah, it's uh, it was a refresh of the website. It was due because the, the blog was felt very very old. Uh, so we we really needed to to rebrand the whole thing. Uh, yeah. So why why the dog? The dog, yeah, uh, that's something that never, actually no, but nobody never asked me about the logo of the blog. Probably it's the first time I talk about it because you know I associate the dog with being the best friend uh, of of man. So the the idea, the motto of the blog is the best the ar- the best friend of the architect. So that's hence the dog. You know, <laughs> that was the the idea behind having this companion. Because I, was- I, I think I think it's also an awesome idea. It's never in you have never obvious I- ideas. I. I like a lot of the, the the articles you write and and the points of view, you, you, the different perspectives you you put on on um, on different topics. And um, I was one. I was um, I wanted to ask you because, for example, you you when you go through the the website of the big picture, you have these uh, just astonishing pictures. They look awesome. They they have this amazing uh, storytelling and. Um, they create this certain atmosphere, and um, but what I was wondering, I, I've seen among your clients, you have also um, maybe what is currently one of the most famous Italian architects, um, which is uh, the studio Bueri, Stefano Bueri, 
um, how did you how did you get got to be known from such a firm and how did you land them as a as a client or if you if you can share a little bit more about that story there's another coincidence because um, at the time when I was working in uh, in Rotterdam uh, with this visitation office uh, we got this project it was my final project at the, at the office actually and it was this big development in, uh, in Utrecht uh, Wonderwoods this, this this tower these two towers in, in Wonderwoods at the time it was just a tender so it was a competition and then when we got to know who were the you know it works like this in the industry um, you got contacted well that's how it worked because the um, the CEO of the office was very well connected with is very well connected with with developers in the Netherlands so this is how it worked um, the CEO of the visualization company got contacted by by the developers for this tender and then afterwards just afterwards we discovered who the architects uh, the architects were one was Mvsa Architects, uh, an Amsterdam-based firm, and the other one was Stefano Boeri Architects uh, in Italy, or Milan, of course. So you know, there was me and another friend of mine, Marco Stecca, who is working at uh, another office in uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam Prolog. Uh, where the two of us working for a <laughs> for a Dutch firm on a on a project by an Italian architect. So it was a funny story. Uh, it was doing the 3D 360 images. I was doing the still images. And so at the end of project, uh, Boeri and I, no, no, not, not him, but the, the office and I were, we kept in touch. And then when I when I just left the office, I let them know that I was just starting my own office. And they just contacted me for for other vertical forests and other 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 buildings, you know. So that, that's how it, it got started, basically. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting story. I think that, uh, for example, when you, um, I noticed that uh, when I came here in in Frankfurt, uh, because here is uh, the um, the city, it's not so big as people think usually, but there is this um, the, there is a lot of uh, going and there, there is a lot going on in the uh, in the in the industry because a lot is being built, and um, there is the German uh, Museum of Architecture. So they do the um, the high rise prize every two years. So they they give the prize to the best high rise in the world, and um, they, they gave it to Boeri and uh, a few. And then after Boeri, big wanted Björk Ingels Group. So I got to meet uh, Björk Ingels once. I've talked to him because um, he was here for the opening of the skyscraper they built in in uh, in Frankfurt. And um, there were also some of his partners. Uh, so if you start, I think that when you start working in the field and you try to dig more and more and more and more, you get you get contacts to these big names. It's people who have these idols usually, but the reality is that th- those are also people, and you just need to 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 dig into the field and uh, work and. There, the the field is not so big in the end of the day, I think. No, no, especially if you work in a city like uh, Rotterdam, for example. You were mentioning Frankfurt. I can mention you Rotterdam. Parties where yeah. there were just a mix of architects coming from different offices. That that both parties were in, <laughs> in my in my time in Rotterdam. So it's it's easy to to get contacts it's, if you stay long enough. So yes, it's uh, it's a small world. Uh, there's a lot of you know. I also but I've I've seen that you've been also very active on the visualization uh, scene. F- uh, for example, you you went to the D two conference, which is one of the main uh, conferences about uh, uh, CG architecture, and um, also you have partnership with the the, the school in Venice. Uh, the what is called the academy there? No, it was not a scholarship. I just attended a attended a master class in uh, in Venice. Uh, they don't like month program. The State of Art Academy, probably you. You're, you're referring yeah, to. the State of Art Academy. So you you've you've uh, attended their class. When when did you attend their class? It was end of 2015, summer of 2015. Yeah. And uh, do you think there was a big uh, a big shift for you also in your uh, being more self-conscious about what you do when you, when you work or did that help you a lot to to put your your skill set 
It helped, uh, me. It helped me for sure because um, it helped me giving me confirmations about things that I already had done so so far that, so far at that time. It was a confirmation of doing certain things in a certain way. So it was good for me to see the pros do what I'm doing. So probably I'm doing good things. Uh, of course, so state of art teaches a lot of things, taught me a lot of things, but most of what I, I learned there, I had to readapt it and shift it to my, my workflow because at that time, probably they, they're changing this, but at, at the time, the final project, so I was a really small, uh, a really small building, a cabin in, in a, a bespoke environment, so to say. So you had to design also the environment for your cabin. So it, it was something really different from what I'm doing right now. Um, it's something that you cannot easily translate to that scale. Uh, we do, you know, with the big picture, we do uh, medium to large scale projects, also master plan, like very large master plans, towers, mixed use. Uh, so you cannot always translate what you learn there to what I do at the moment. So it was for sure a really nice learning experience. I got to meet great people. Some people I still in touch with them as well. Um, Probably it's a really good experience for people who are fresh starting out in the field. Probably for people that already have some experience, could be interesting uh, depending on your background, so to say. And um, I wanted to ask you because, uh, for example, I've, I, a lot of a lot of the architectural office they have no real. Um, clue about uh, archivists and uh, in the offices I've been working they didn't have this clear idea about what they they wanted from an image and they were just you know wanted to have a nice image so I've tried to to get them into collaborating with other more famous offices and uh, for example I remember we contacted um, I think the Spanish firm the Beauty and the Beat something like this and um, they, for example, sent back uh, an email. They say uh, they said something like, um, "Okay, you give us your project. We need a 3D model, and we will uh, create uh, the imagery. But uh, we will be in charge of how it's gonna look like." Mm -hmm. So they say, "Okay, we're gonna set up the 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 mood like the." I don't remember if they said the mood, but if we say, okay, we want an uh, image which is uh, sunny and which is uh, with a friendly weather, they they know that, but they will take care about the composition. How do you um, keep your your brand quality with your clients? Are you sometimes uh, asked from your clients to do an image that you wouldn't do? Hmm. on your own or how if, if you have this issue you know i try to to get it on a um, on a really collaborative level with my clients i'm really open to to their inputs of course i want to retain a certain integrity to my to my work a certain quality so that's what we do as well we we give some 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 ideas to our clients at the beginning of a project when we have a you know a reasonable complete uh, set of information and 3d model so once we have that, we start working on it and we just dish out a lot of idea, different ideas for camera composition and atmosphere. So the client has a set of choices that he can just pick from. Sometimes uh, it's, it should be really good to clarify this to a client and tell them, okay, these are the choices and we have to go forward with, it, with this. Sometimes clients think they can, can just change the sketch um, after they pick them. So that, that's a process I'm still streamlining, but that's more or less the way that I, the way that I wanted to go. Of course, sometimes it, it still happens to, to do an image that you don't you don't really like because the client really needs that image. You try to do it your best. I mean, you try to advise your clients uh, on the reasons why that image, the way he wants he wants it, it, it doesn't work. So probably in that case, I will just try to still do what they they propose but to also my own version just to get them compared and, and probably how usually the how usually the process looks like do you have uh, for example when you receive an assignment uh, do you create first a couple of perspectives you think are working well or a mood board about the the lighting and um, what is if you can 
explain more about your your process not in a technical mm, way but more into how you proceed to create this atmosphere because um i have to i mean i can tell you for sure as someone that's uh, in the field that a lot of the images you have uh, posted on 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 your um as um on your portfolio let's say on the big picture visual they're very very iconic images uh they have this very um this, they have this character but it's not always the same you kind of bring out uh, a stronger character from from the projects you're designing uh, you're uh, representing so i was curious how is your uh let's say soft skill um method when you start from the perspectives how you you create the mood and yeah what i do is just try to go very organically in a project uh, so if I get a, a finished set of information, I just set up everything that I need to set up and I just try to explore, you know. I just go around like a, like a photographer in the in the outfield. So just the only thing, that I, I just do it in the 3D software. So I just go around the project and try nice nice angles. Uh, sometimes I still do it. I, I do it with projects that are already finished. I try to, uh, to get new angles out of what I already did. Probably I... I I will try to improve things, but that's what I basically do. I just go around the project and I try to set up uh, different lighting conditions, different different atmospheres to see how the building reacts in a, at a certain time of the day, of the year, in a certain light. Um, so we try to explore options, and we and we do it. We just when, for example, when we are on two uh, two people on the same project, uh, we just exchange ideas. We do our own sketches, so to call them drafts. Um, we call them concepts. We do the first concepts. Um, we compare them and we choose what to what to send to the client. What are the strongest concepts that we we could propose for for the project? And we aim to have a uh, like sixty percent, seventy percent complete image by then by the first phase. So the client never sees from us uh, handwritten sketches or white white clay renders, which are white renders that give you just the idea of the camera. But what we aim to do is just give them um, an image that really has an, in, has an int of mood and camera angle uh, of the poten- that shows them the full potential of the of the final image somehow. It's not always easy, especially when you work on competitions, because competitions are always really hectic and things are prone to change very quickly. So uh, it's not something you can apply all, all the time. But uh, that's what we try to do. If we have a, a slower project, that's that's something we we we, we have really well streamlined. When says this competition is more is more difficult because client <laughs> comes with changes, probably the changes his mind, and that's the most difficult part of the job handling the 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 changes from the client. They're they changing their mind on moods and on uh, on aspects of their of their project. And and usually how how long uh, for because um, how long it takes to you to make um, an image because I guess sometimes you get one project from which you need to do different perspectives and then uh, the amount per, of time per image is reduced because of course you have the same model different views maybe but usually how how much it takes you to to make one one of uh, those uh, images it really depends I mean we we just give an outline to our clients we say. For example, three images in two weeks, uh, which is a reasonable, fast, not so fast, but reasonable time. Uh, but it's really subjective. It's really dependent on the, uh, on the type of project. For example, if it's a master plan, could be a really easy task. It's, it's counterintuitive, but sometimes master plan are easier because you have to detail less. Uh, especially if you have a, a drone shot, you can just do a photo insertion with less detail so it doesn't take so long. Or if it's a really detailed uh, street shot that you have to put a, a really a lot of effort into, um, it's it's difficult to say it beforehand. But we just keep ourselves on this, um, you know, on this indication with clients. Even though uh, we need certain details to tell our clients uh, what's going to what's what's the time required. Of course, clients <laughs> want everything really fast and uh, as soon as possible, but before saying yes to a client, we have to to see the project. We have to to see if it's in our possibilities, what, what how long does it take? What's the what's the effort on on the project basically? So we don't ju- just try to give an indication of time after we received some information. That's the, that's the gist of it. 
Yeah, but I think that also the clients um, come to you to 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 have this certain quality and this iconic imagery. So uh, this is also part of the whole of the whole activity. And uh, I was wondering, do you have a favorite? Uh, composition or favorite image or type of image you love to make? I don't know, for example, uh, night moods or um, I think most of your images are some, something like sunset or sunrise, but there are some also some. So if you have a favorite winter, summer of or every every project you receive, you feel it different. How how? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't. I try not to stick too much with uh, with a with a trademark uh, with a trademark mood. Maybe I should try to start doing that as well because offices are known for their for their mood for the mood of, of their images. But I'm I feel I'm still in the phase of experimenting what I what I want to do with this. So I'm not trying to to attach the, the name of the big pictures to a certain to a certain palette or to a certain mood because I want to still experiment. Um, I like to work a lot with autumn images, uh, with pinkish images as well, like sun, sunrise, for example. Uh, it's not something you really see on the website because there's a, there's a lot of confidential projects for that. But that, that's the type of images I like to work the most with. Uh, as camera compositions, I, um, there's something else that I don't try to stick to a, to a certain composition even though, because I don't like doing the same thing all over because it gets too easy otherwise. I, I see a lot, Italian, Italian visualizers are going a lot lately uh, with this central point perspective views, not just Italians, but in general, there's a, there's a really a, a common perspective. I, I realize a lot, I have a lot of that as well because they work really well, but if I can, I just try to, to push away from that because it's, uh, it becomes kind of a, the easy way. So. And trying to experiment uh, according to the project as well. It's not so easy because clients are used to see a, a certain kind of image, so uh, it's not always easy to to push different different things to a client that is yeah. to see center point perspectives, for example. But I try to experiment, even though if it means to do a project uh, for myself, like a project yeah, for and, um... myself. But uh, because, for example, I've read somewhere in some uh, articles or interview uh, or I've heard an interview with the um, founders of Mir. Mir is, uh, for the people who, doesn't, who don't know, it's uh, basically one of the most famous uh, visualization companies because they do these very, very hyper-realistic images. And uh, they said that the most difficult images to do are usually um, sunny images yeah. with daylight. Yeah. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I can agree with that because it's uh, it's not easy to get a strike have a striking image with a with a daylight mode. It's uh, it's kind of difficult. There's there's ways to do it, but one is really difficult to get the right colors of a daytime image. It's uh, it, it it also really differs differs from from the time of the year from the country that you're in. Getting the blue of the sky is one of the of the most difficult things. Getting the the palette of the greens of the blues of the sky it's it's really 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 difficult. I can say that uh, for sure. Uh, and because it's it's easier to get a night image, it's for sure um, it's more striking. It's uh, it's more emotional. And there's also you know me trying to get a challenge. Like I try to push myself on. I do a lot of daytime images, for example, because I, I like to push myself on this, like, uh, how can I do a good, how, how does it make, what does it make a good daytime image? So I try to experiment also on, on daytime, on daytime a lot. Uh, that's a really interesting topic to, topic to, to explore. Because, you know, it's uh, get a reference of a, you know, a epic sunset or epic, epic night. But getting a good reference of a, of a daytime image that's more tricky. So I kind of agree with the statement. Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. They were also saying that, uh, for example, it's easier. Some 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 visualizers uh, tend to put this, uh, I don't know, very attractive uh, girls uh, as people in those images, which <laughs> which makes everything even worse because then you you ruin the whole uh, yeah uh, attention on the on the projects on the architecture. That, um, but story. what I wanted there's another whole story. I want, the yeah. renders because they can they can make or break an image. I think they're really you know people in the renders are really an under underappreciated topic, but. 
uh, I can say for sure, I can, I can tell you for sure, and I, and I can see that a trademark of really great uh, offices, great, great visualization offices, is that have their their own uh, cut out people. Cut out people. They, they don't have cliche cliche cut out people. They they just do bespoke people for each project, and it's something that I that I really want to do with my own projects. I just don't have the time since I'm I'm basically me myself and I and uh, a few people that help me from time to time right now. It's really difficult to to work on that aspect, but I I'm I'm aware that makes a world of difference to an image if you put the right people doing the right thing in the right way. I I always do this example of, of kindergarten images. It's really easy to do to get into the temptation of doing kindergarten images with kids doing all sort of things, which is probably not how kindergarten work work. So it's just much better looking at the reference of a kindergarten class and try to copy how the people uh, behave, how kids behave in that class, rather than just putting kids randomly in the image. And it's something I'm really passionate about and I wanted to to improve in my, my work. Yeah. My, my personal way to evaluate a good image is so when I look at the image, uh, which, when it's a still image uh, and you look at it, um, it uh, feels if it's a good image, you you can connect to a story to the image and imagine the image moving. Because I see that a lot in a lot of your also in your images that, that you have on the website that you can put yourself in the image and imagine a story and a, and a story being inside the image. You see this park and you see people playing and you can imagine that maybe you're going to that park uh, on the weekend. Or you see a winter image in a in a big city with a lot of traffic, and you think about you when you're in the winter, you know, trying to to hurry up to to go in a um, in a safe place. So I think that's um, that's something that you completely nail very well in your imagery. But um, I wanted to ask you because recently I've been often contacted uh, on. On social media, from people coming from the most exotic countries on the world, <laughs> asking me because they see I'm an architect and they contact me and tell me, "Yeah, we are um, an office in I don't know somewhere China. We do a lot of images, and we can make you these images for for I don't know thousand euros or something." Um, do you have an issue with that? Do you have um, because uh, do you also to COVID? Do you are you afraid that the the um, the pricing you you have to compete with will get lower and lower, or how? What is your opinion on that topic? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a hot topic. I try not to have a strong opinion on that, you know, because I just try to see how things evolve. Uh, I also think that pricing is very subjective to to a client, because you know. If you manage to build a strong relationship, a strong bond with your client, and the client trusts what you do rather than wanting just the product, then that's where you, when you have no price, you you, you just have no, you don't have a price tag. Uh, that's something I'm trying to work on. But in general, pricing competition is something that I try not to think too much about because otherwise I. I get too much into the pricing strategy discourse and I just want to do my own pricing. So I try just to stick to my own and find clients who want to pay a service rather than a commodity. So what, what Chinese offices do, that's, I'm sure there's Greek Chinese offices, but uh, what they tend to do is not Chinese, but also a lot of Western European offices, then, I'm, sure, I'm sure of it. They just try to get the job done. So if the architect asks them to, to do an image with a certain specifications, they just get the, the work done. What I'm trying to do is to uh, trying to help my client telling their story the best way. Well, the motto, the mission of the big picture is bridging the gap between audience and, and architecture because I'm, I'm really convinced that uh, renders images, render images are a great way to, to market architecture to people that don't speak the language of architects. And I also believe that architecture visualizers, um, because of their background, they're experts in in communicating architecture through this medium. And and architects should should get a bit less, you know, um, 
a bit less micromanaging on this aspect. So if you can get this uh, into your workflow, into your process, and you, you become a consultant and a lie to your client, that's when you, you stop worrying about pricing and, and you start thinking about how to help your clients. So I try to leave the pricing issue to those people that offer images as a commodity. I want to build a service and I have a certain price and I keep, I try to stick with that because I, you know, I'm trying to, to offer them a consult, uh, a consultation, uh, not a, not an image as a product, you know? Yeah. Because in the end of the day, also the images is your product. So you are, um, doing your own product of course in in the best uh, being also the best service for for your clients um also another thing, so images nowadays are easier and easier to to get even even architects in house they can get reasonably good images with uh, real time rendering softwares like enscape for revit for example or sketchup probably you know about enscape right it's a uh, it's a we we have it at the office, yeah. I think. So I, I hear from a lot of offices that I speak to that they use Enscape to for client communication, and that's that's all right. I mean, uh, for certain uses, it's all right. But if you want, you know, a, a communication strategy, a visual strategy for a project, uh, that's that's where good good architectural visualization companies should come in. So I think that in the long run, uh, artist companies would don't offer a a consultancy that offer a strat a visual strategy service somehow they don't include this sooner or later they're they're uh, they're doomed to to end because images uh, are starting to get a widespread product uh, architects are will be very soon able to do reasonably good images in no time so those companies that offer the image as a as a commodity will will surely start having troubles soon yeah, I think that they will survive in in the countries where uh, keeping the prices low is sustainable, yeah. because uh, we know that in Western Europe, whatever you're sitting, you need to have uh, uh, every every software needs to be licensed, and you need to pay taxes. So uh, it won't be sustainable if the market um, goes too low. But I think that your point of view with the um, strategy uh, image uh, representation strategy or visual strategy it's a very interesting point of view and uh, that's a it's a very good insight you just you just said there because um i i have my girlfriend she's a, a brand strategist and i think that uh, that could that's something that could transition into architecture through through the good visualization companies they would there's a lot of firms that are already starting to doing this i see firms that offer uh, you know integrated strategies for uh, for construction companies for example that they they don't just do the image but they of course they do the animations they do the real time they maybe also do the the website uh, there are uh, you know they offer a package of services that they're, they're no longer just visualization companies they 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 become something else and that's something that really fascinates it fascinates me as well as a um, a market, you know, niche, so to say. It's not easy, of course, because you have to, to get a lot of contacts, you have to address certain people. Um, but it's something really fascinating that, that I would like to explore sooner or later. Yeah, I'm very I'm very curious to see how it's uh, how we, how you will develop it and how it's gonna develop. Uh, for sure I'm gonna keep following your blog, your your company because uh, you are a great uh, source of inspiration for for your uh, fellow uh, architects and designers and um, especially you've you've helped me even if you didn't know a lot through my through my studies and through my career. Uh, happy to hear. So, uh, <laughs> I want to I want to thank you for for accepting uh, to spend some of your uh, weekend time on on this very friendly chat and where you gave a lot of interesting uh, stories of your life and of your points of view, which are which are sort of showing why you got where you are. And um, I'm glad that there are people like you, and I hope there will be more and more after they listen. To our conversation, uh, uh, as I told you in the beginning of the conversation, uh, also I want to give uh, this platform to people to their to to tell their stories. And uh, where could, um, if you want to shout out once uh, one more time, 
where people can find more about you or ask you questions if they're curious to know more about you after this conversation? Well, of course, there's a there's my blog, which is Control Set, the Control Set blog, Control uh, Ctrl uh, hyphen Z dot it, which is a uh, just in Italian, and of course, there's the the website of my studio, which is bigpicturevisual.com, dot uh, which is of course the website for my image making activity, and that's the two main outlets. Of course, over there you you find you find my contacts if you want if you want to get in touch, even just to say hi and. You know, just a strike a conversation. I'm all up for it. So feel free to 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 get in touch. Yeah, thank thank you very much, Federico, one more time for being on the show. And thank you to the listeners to to have uh, listened to this conversation and keep also supporting the podcast by following the podcast on the usual social media, which is Instagram, it's at TCA Podcast, uh, the Facebook page, the Creative Insider and the LinkedIn page the creative insider and people yeah follow federico follow his work and i hope uh, you enjoy this conversation thank you federico and uh, bye bye thank you so much bye